Thank you for joining. How cool is it to be back here live on stage? I came here a little earlier and I saw a big crowd outside and um, got excited. And somebody told me, oh, oh, it's Chuck. You're following Chuck and Jackie. So I was like, okay, that's why. That's why everybody's over here. Uh, but I've, I've brought my own celebrity guest with me. Uh, any Formula One fans over here? We're going we're gonna to have um, uh, Ed Green from uh, McLaren Racing join us here shortly. Um, but uh, one kind of cautionary tale, um, I'm not going to take any supply chain questions. I'm going to focus on hybrid workspaces. So uh, some housekeeping here. We're going to continue using Slido. Those of you familiar with um, F1, uh, jump on the Slido. We've got a, a set of questions there. We'll show you the results along the way. It's, a sub, uh, it's, it's three questions out there, and we'll share that using Slido. Slido, by the way, is part of the WebEx suite that we've shipped last year. Now, before I bring up Ed, let's talk a little bit about hybrid work. Now, we all remember March 2020, working from an office became working from home in an instant. And then more recently, as offices have started to open up, we've all tried to pivot to seeing colleagues in person. But you know what? The world has changed. It's changed forever. How we work has changed, changed forever. Hybrid is the new normal. But, you know, we should also acknowledge that hybrid work is both different and way, way harder than how we worked the last couple of years. We actually know this because we have started to see new challenges emerge. When you go from mostly remote employees to a mix of remote and in-person employees, your meetings actually start to look something like this. Right? So if you're remote, you can't really tell if those five people in the conference room are they paying attention? And guess what happens when two of them stand up and start to whiteboard? You get completely left out of those conversations. And as people start to get back into the office, they must get experiences that are better than when they were working at home. Otherwise, they're not going to come back. And then video usage before 2019 was minimal. What's going to happen? When you have, let's say, 100 employees back in the office, all jumping on video, is your network ready? And you've, got, you've gone from 50 to 60 offices to 50 to 60,000 remote offices, all of them connecting to third-party clouds. How do you secure and manage your hybrid work experience? We believe that seamless and secure experiences in this new world are going to require new solutions your collaboration software, your network, and your hardware will need to work seamlessly together. And that is what we are focused on here at Cisco. And throughout the next few days, you'll, you'll hear us talk about three main things. How we are reimagining workspaces. We've created a new WebEx suite purpose-built for flexible work styles. And how Cisco security and manageability can help you deliver those hybrid work experiences. So let me touch upon those a little bit. Firstly, we've all jo joined meetings from all of these locations at some point. And over the last 12 months, we've completely redone our hardware portfolio and our software to enable working from these workspaces. We've reimagined these workspaces. We also interact with each other in many different ways. And not all of these interactions are equal. They all require different levels of preparation and engagement. So my 10-person board meeting is very different from my 10-person team meeting. Stakes are way higher. My 10-person team meeting is also very different from a 5,000-person all-hands. And then there are events like this. We've got in-person participants and remote participants during the event and after the event. And that is why we've been working on packing the WebEx suite with a new set of tools that go beyond just meetings and calling to support all of these interactions. They're all included in the new WebEx suite. And then lastly, we provide complete visibility and manageability for your hybrid work experiences. It starts with the WebEx Control Hub, which is a central place to manage all of your collaboration experiences, your software, your hardware, your meetings, all in one place. Secondly, the Meraki dashboard provides administrators with a browser-based monitoring and configuration of Meraki devices, and services, whether it's the home office, or the branch office, or your office. 
And then we've integrated DNA spaces into your ecosystem. So it gives your facilities team with information about occupancy levels, space utilization, so they can manage their spaces. And finally, most recently, we've integrated Thousand Eyes. And that gives you unparalleled visibility into your network so you can troubleshoot your hybrid work experiences. This is the new hybrid world. The tools you're going to need are going to be dramatic, dramatically different from what you're used to. So let me first start by showing you a video on how one of our partners and customers, McLaren Racing, adapted to this new hybrid world. And then we'll invite Ed on stage and have a conversation. So let's, let's roll the video. Making some of the world's fastest cars has evolved dramatically. Today, the McLaren F1 team uses WebEx to collaborate in entirely new ways, from the engineers to the drivers, all the way to the track, instantly and securely, to push the boundaries of performance even further. WebEx, driving hybrid work. So today, I'm happy to introduce Ed Green onto stage to talk to us about how McLaren Racing has adapted to the hybrid work transition. Ed? joining us all the way from London. Yeah, uh, yeah, pleasure to be back here in Vegas and uh, yeah, definitely looking forward to it next year when we go and race on the strip. But uh, yeah, great to be back here at Cisco Live. I'm really looking forward to that. The 2023 season has a race right here in Vegas. Yeah. That's going to be exciting. So why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, your role at uh, McLaren. It seems like a pretty darn cool job. I'm sure many of you would like to have that job. Yeah, I mean, most days it doesn't feel like a, a proper job. So. Uh, my role is I've been with McLaren for four and a half years. I look after all the commercial technology across the racing team, uh, and that's embedding our technical partners across uh, Formula One, IndyCar, Extreme E, Formula E, and eSports. And so I'm responsible for, for helping embed that technology into the racing team, ultimately to help us go faster out on track. Um, you know, and I think we've been doing that for well over 60 years now. Um, we're just about to our 60th birthday next year, so uh, yeah, it's a pretty exciting uh, time yeah. at McLaren. Now, thanks to the Netflix series, a lot of people have started following Formula One. But tell us a little bit more about McLaren Racing beyond what uh, we've probably seen on, on, on TV. Yeah, I think, yeah, Netflix show is awesome. Um, but it's not just Formula One. So we've been doing Formula One for 60 years now. Um, and we've had some amazing drivers in our history from uh, Lewis Hamilton, Mika Hakkinen, Ayrton Senna, just to name a few. And we've got an awesome lineup at the moment with Lando and Daniel. Um, but it's been more than that over the last 60 years. We've also raced in Can-Am, we've raced in IndyCar, and so really we've had this, uh, this rich history of racing. And we've been doing things like, you know, IoT, before it was called IoT, for, since 30 years ago we've been collecting data on the car. Uh, so it's quite handy now people call it IoT, and it just happens that our IoT sensor does 230 miles an hour uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but, you know, in order to do that, you need to, you know, have really good technology at the core of it. We collect in the region of about a terabyte and a half of data per race weekend. And that means over the course of a season, it's about 11.8 billion data points come off the car, uh, which we have to collect and analyze. So you really need uh, a lot of technology to make that happen and uh, a lot of data analysis behind the scenes in order to, uh, to crunch all of that. That's amazing, yeah. Uh, so I know one of the questions we had, and I, we, I think we have it up there, um, uh, who do you think is going to win the 2020 F1 Constructors Championship? And uh, we've got some McLaren fans out there. <laughs> Um, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, Red Bull's off to a pretty good start this year. What do you think? Where's McLaren going to finish? Maybe, what, what do you think? Uh, uh, it's, a really, it's a really interesting season, lots of rule changes. So uh, I think fourth is looking pretty good. Maybe third if we're a bit lucky. Uh, I'd love to go and win it, but um, I think uh, Red Bull have, have got the edge this season. So. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, it's amazing how things change so quickly from season to season. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that initial shock of the pandemic, uh, especially as it relates to McLaren Racing. You actually had a few races that had to be cancelled. How did you and uh, you know, the drivers adapt to that kind of sudden shock? Yeah, it was you know, one of those sort of weird moments in, in, in work when you, know, you get an email sent around at 
three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon telling everyone to go home and, and there wasn't an instruction of when to come back to the office. Uh, and no one was really sort of sure as to what was going to happen. I think the, the sort of saving grace for us was that actually we're quite lucky that for, for the last 40 years we've been working on the road, right? We work from garages, we work from hotel rooms, we work from airplane lounges, we, we work from, you know, places like this, our engineering hub that we travel to each race with. Um, so in a way, the, the pandemic wasn't a shock as to working remotely. We've been doing that for quite some time, but it was a shock of the scale of which we had to go and work remotely. You know, we're used to taking 80 engineers to a racetrack, and that suddenly we had to have 800 members of the team, all based from their bedrooms, living rooms, and their home offices. So that was a really big change, and I think it was, it was the scale that, that caught us by surprise. And, you know, when we did that, we had to learn from the F1 team and, uh, and really sort of understand uh, you know, the practices they put in place. But, you know, environments like that that you see behind me, that's a, a, a set of four trucks that unfold and park on top of each other. Yeah. And this becomes people's homes. So, um, you know, we're used to working from unusual spaces. Yeah. And I think you've got some pictures of, of these spaces. It's just fascinating to me how you guys build this out. Yeah. Every so, time during the race. Yeah. So this is the engineering hub. So this is where we would, you know, when we travel throughout Europe, we take four trucks with us. And they unfold into this configuration. Um, and, you know, it's a pretty noisy environment. You've got some pretty yeah. noisy neighbors. Everyone's been used to that with um, putting themselves on mute. Uh, but above, uh, above this or below where the, the tires are is, is where the engineers sit. So underneath us is a very warm environment. We put all the tires down there. It's where we sort of store them for the race. Um, so they're already being sort of prepped and pressurized and warmed up. And then we move above the, um, the garage and you can see another shot of it here. So, you know, we're working in quite a strange environment. There's two lorries parked either side here. In the void, we've got the tires. And in those two lorries on the bottom, we'll have logistics and uh, spares. So those are the things we carry to each race with us. And then we go back above. And this is our working from home or our working from the track. And so for some engineers, this will be all they see for the best part of six months. You know, they'll be away from the office. They don't really do the work from home. They'll be working from this sort of environment. And so we have to sort of create these um, office spaces and these environments where engineers uh, you know, feel at home, but also there's design cues that link them back to the head office. When you've got people that don't meet for you know, half a season, it's a really interesting challenge as how do you make people feel connected. Um, and so you know, if, we, if we push on, have a look at it, you, know, you can see the other side of them here. Um, the engineering hub, things to point out is that, that wall on the far side is actually a felt wall. It's made of recycled material, but it helps absorb a lot of the noise and, and that, comes from the, um, that comes from the race circuits. But also with that, we could start to take a few design cues as well with it. Um, it's not just engineers, the drivers have to work from track, so they'll do media engagements on WebEx, they'll do fan calls. Uh, I think Daniel might be a little bit late to his there. Um, but you know, they're also interacting with it and, and having to, to do their work from there. Yeah, and you've got WebEx that plays an important role in, in, in a lot of that. I, I heard you use the term box, box, box uh, when you were talking the other day, and I thought I knew what it meant. <laughs> uh, having watched some Formula One, but uh, you've, you've taken it uh, to a whole different level. <laughs> yeah, so again, if you, this is one of our meeting rooms back at um, the McLaren Technology Center. It's a, it's a beautiful building, uh, but a pretty hard one to install technology into. There's lots of glass, lots of metal. You can see on the back wall there, there's the same felt that helps with absorbing sound in meeting rooms, but also makes it feel and look like the engineering hubs, so people can kind of interact with different rooms. One of the things that really bugs me in meeting rooms is when people don't put everything back straight. Yeah. When you work in Formula One, you develop this OCD concept. And so we looked at the, the cars in the garage. And when the cars park up in the garage, wherever they are in the world, you know, this coming weekend in Canada, um, there's like a, a marker on the floor that dictates where they should go. And the cars get parked perfectly within those markers. And so we thought we'd bring a bit of that back to the office and have a bit of fun. And so we have box, box, box. And that reminds people where they should be putting the, um, the room navigator back into its place. And if they move it, they'll see WebEx underneath it. Um, it still bugs me when people don't put it back in place. Yeah. Um, but little design cues like that that sort of encourage you know, what we've had in Formula One and how we can bring that back to the office and have a bit of fun. So you've taken that concept of a pit stop, which those of you not familiar with Formula One, uh, is the driver coming home to get the things replaced, and you've taken that to the conference room. So uh, fascinating. Um, now, I think we had another slide up, Paul, which was about a pit stop. So. Uh, these pit stops, they seem to have gotten faster and faster, and I think that's the right answer there, and I think McLaren has one of the faster pit stops this year. Yeah, I think for the first four races of the year, we had three of the four part fastest pit stops. It's, it's an amazing part of the sport where uh, when the pit crew head out into the pit lane, uh, their heart rate is the equivalent of doing the 200-meter sprint. So it's an enormous cardiac output for them just to go and do the 
tyre change, and they've got to do that four, maybe six times an F1 race. Um, and now with the guns, there's a lot of, um, you know, less automation. We have to physically confirm, and we've got, you know, uh, wheel nuts on and off the car, and so, yeah, they're, um, they're pretty quick at the moment. It's amazing how much these pit stops have improved. They used to be like 10 plus seconds at one point, yeah. Yeah, but also they've got a lot safer, which is important as well, so. Yeah. Now, thanks to Netflix, the uh, fan base has grown, and I know you use LoveX to engage with your fan base, uh, so tell us more about how that's changed, especially as uh, in, a, in the early days you did not have as many people uh, participating in the races, yeah. Yeah, well, and first, I think Netflix is an awesome uh, advocate for our sport. I think what they've done and what they've delivered and how they've dramatized it is, is incredible to watch. Uh, it's the only way that my mum truly understands what I do as my job, which is um, you know, great thanks, thanks, Netflix. Um, but it has engaged a lot more fans, and so we really see this kind of change. And I was lucky enough to be out in Austin last year, in Miami this year, and you, know, you just see this huge change in, in who's coming to races. And, and to see it, uh, you know, Austin last year, there's over 400,000 people attended the race over the course of the weekend. So just a huge change and in, in growth in popularity, which is great. But I think also it's, it's increased the demands on what our fans and what our partners expect. And, and when the pandemic really kicked off, and we, we started to go back racing, one of the things we, we do is we take our guests to track. Yeah. We take you to the garage and we show you around and we, we bring you into the heart of the team and we show you the behind the scenes. Um, and we suddenly realized with COVID, with bubbles, with travel restrictions, we weren't able to take guests with us. And I had a very strange phone call, but the, the net result of it was we, we built a TV studio at the office. And never did I think if I asked Zach to sign off a business case for uh, a TV studio and cameras and mixing desks and audio galleries, I never thought I'd get it. Um, but we created a studio at the MTC. We, con we converted one of our meeting rooms uh, and we built this studio you see here. And now we have two guests, two hosts each, uh, pretty much every race weekend um, that we then broadcast a show to. We take people live into the garage, uh, we ask them, you know, questions interactive through Slido. Um, all of it's hosted through WebEx events, which is a really good way for us to push out and engage with our fans. Um, and the team internally love it as well. They, they get a chance to go and see what it's like to be at a racetrack. Um, but just an awesome way. And, you know, over the, the course of last year, we've, uh, we've had fans that have designed flags for Daniel Ricciardo through WebEx, and uh, he voted on them. So, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome, but just a new way to engage with fans. And I never thought we'd be doing that at the start of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, it just warms my heart to see the way you're using WebEx, the events and the noise cancellation technology comes in very handy in those noisy spaces. So, yeah. And then Slido, of course. So, yeah. I think we had one more question about the fans, and this one is a tricky one. Um, who's your favorite F1 driver? Uh, looks like Lewis Hamilton up there. Um, and then uh, Lando came in a second. Which, uh, you, you want to venture a choice, Lando or Daniel? For those of you not familiar with F1, there's two drivers per team. Uh, you, you want to venture who's, who's your favorite? Uh, I think our CEO is floating around somewhere, so I better not say who my, uh, who my <laughs> okay. favorite is. But um, yeah, they're both lovely to work with, and they, they push us on lots of technical answers as well. So I, I'll refrain from yeah. that one. Maybe when we are not being recorded backstage, you can share <laughs> who's your favorite. I won't, I won't tell anybody. So. Um, so let's um, uh, t t talk about um, uh, real estate. You've got a beautiful campus out in, uh, in, in, in London, uh, and um, how are you approaching that going forward? Yeah, I think our office, um, I think if we can have a look at it, it it's an amazing, beautiful space. This is it here in, in Woking, uh, just outside London. This is about 20 minutes outside Heathrow, and it's a, it's a fantastic space. It's um, designed by Norman Foster. It's a bit of a James Bond meets... Sounds, looks familiar uh, to a campus back uh, in San Jose. Yeah, I think Apple got a few design cues from us a few years ago. Um, you know, it's a beautiful building. It's, it's got some great roots in sustainability. That lake out the front helps cool the building. Um, but it's a complex building. You know, not only are we designing cars in it, we're producing, we're manufacturing. Uh, there's people that come there as part of their, their sort of, you know, office workload. Um, so, so it's really tough to sort of build an environment that meets all of those different needs. And, you know, especially in a building that's, this building is now 20, 21 years old. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it had a very different design ethos back in the day. The meeting rooms were designed to be inner sanctums where people met to collaborate around secret ideas. It wasn't designed to be highly collaborative and have external influences coming in. And now on any day of the you know, week, we are collaborating in every platform possible with so many different manufacturers, so many different third parties. You know, it really is tricky, but, but these meeting rooms are all glass, all metal. It's an acoustic nightmare. Um, and, and we have to think about how people work as well and start to change it up. So we've, um, we've made a little bit of progress on that. Yeah. 
you've got a desk or a desk pro at home, which, which, which is your favorite device? <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so I think the Desk Pro. I think if I'm at home, I normally get in a bit of a fight over yeah. who's using it that day. But um, that's just really simple. You know, your day comes up, you can click through what you need to yeah. do. Um, and the environment as well, like, you know, working from home, I, I challenge anyone to, uh, you know, lie convincingly that they haven't done a WebEx call from the sofa. And so, uh, you know, when you come back to the office, well, we want to put sofas in the office to allow people to do the same thing. And, um, you know, one of the other thing we noticed was that as people came back to the, the office, um, there were a couple of challenges. The first was uh, the estates and facilities team were really, really busy. And we didn't want to take up their time, you know, drilling into walls, reinforcing them, mounting screens. That just for us at the time wasn't the right thing to do. And when we can pop up devices like, you know, the, the Board Pro and, and we can, you know, drop some of the units into the rooms really quickly, that allowed us to pretty radically and pretty rapidly change the environment. And as soon as we did that, we started getting this, you know, increased uh, unknown capability. We had more sensors in the room, we could do presence detection, we could understand this room that was suddenly full of sensors could give us a lot back more in, you know, yeah. in terms of data about our environment, and we quite like data, which is good. Um, so really quickly, we could turn around to our estates and facilities team and provide them with um, you know, information about room utilization, which we could never do before. And, and then my other favorite game was in the office, you used to you know, watch everyone being like little meerkats. And they'd all pop up from their desks and look around the office to try and guess which room was free. And they'd <laughs> yeah. walk around holding a laptop in one hand with you know, the room booking system, and they'd be going around to see, you know, is it actually being used, is it, is it not? Um, and so stuff like you know, with DNA spaces now, that's, that's becoming a, a bit of a game changer for us, that you know, as people are walking through the space, they can see if a room is being used, they can hold it, uh, they can do that on their mobile, or they can go up to one of the, the board pros and, yeah. and, and take a look at it. So I think for me, you know, really importantly, when you're a really lean IT function in McLaren, there's 18 of us that run IT. Uh, and so, you know, that's quite a small team for an organization that's getting close to a thousand. But our sort of mantra and ethos is, is to use partners and build platforms. And once we build platforms and, and we work with our partners, then everyone can leverage that, you know, as they best see fit. Um, and in this case, you know, we've seen the WebEx has become our hot desk booking platform. We've seen it become our room utilization platform. We've mm -hmm. seen it become, you know, sometimes network analytics through things like Thousand Eyes in the back end of it. So, um, you know, massively important for me to kind of you know, build out that platform and, and rather than just sort of consume, yeah. um, you know, individual product sets. And you have to take that a portion of that platform out to the race uh, yep. 20 times a year. So it's good to have that platform. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget that, you know, we're deploying a, we're deploying a data center right at the edge 20, 22 times a year. And, you know, we think of that as normal, but we're shipping, you know, a huge amount of compute and networking to each racetrack. And, uh, you know, actually there's quite a lot of complexity in doing that. Yeah. Now, I, I know you were a Microsoft Teams shop, uh, and you've switched over to WebEx. So uh, tell us more about uh, why you switched over and how has that gone? And by the way, you're probably still joining Microsoft Teams meetings from uh, uh, suppliers and yeah. our partners and so on. Yeah, I think it's rare that you go a day at work without joining multiple different platforms. I think for me, ultimately, I wanted something that was more powerful and really had collaboration at the heart and, and video at the heart of what it was doing. And, and the Microsoft experience wasn't quite there. And secondly, when it came to deploying rooms and building out that, that hybrid work environment, it was just, you know, there was no unification from the Microsoft stack. You could go over here and buy some hardware from this vendor, and you buy a display from over here, and you kind of bring them together, and, and the room management was really complex, and then, you know, they weren't able to do a lot of the smarts that, um, you know, Control Hub has in the background, and so for me, it became a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah. Uh, it was the first business case I put forward when I joined McLaren four years ago, was to move everyone to WebEx. Um, and then eventually convinced them during the pandemic that it was the right thing to do. And now it just opens up so much um, what we, you know, of what we were able to do. We can build macros to tell people when the rooms are overused, if they've got too many people in a room, if we wanted to do it for COVID safety. Uh, and so it's so agile and nimble that I think we've been able to convince you know, all different stakeholders across the business that it was the right move. And, and just having that unification from software to hardware, you know, I love it when people walk in the rooms and it welcomes them and says, you know, hi, Edward, or hi, Javed. And they go, oh, it's recognized me. And, yeah. and there's just those nice personal touches. Okay. And then um, I know we are uh, almost out of time, but uh, any thoughts on what the future looks like? I know you're using one of our early beta products. Yeah, we've been very lucky to have WebEx Hologram in the office now for uh, coming up to three months. Uh, super, super excited. We've had digital twins of the F1 car virtually for over 30 years now. But for the first time, we're able to you know, hold up a physical part that's been designed in CAD and been 3D printed or manufactured in carbon fiber um, and hold it up in front of Hologram and then the receiving engineer at the other end can put on a headset and see what's happening. Um, for us, that's opening up you know, new, um, new opportunities for design, new locations for design, 
um, you know, really enjoying inputting with the team. Your team are very generous with their time and help us on lots of things. Um, but super excited to see how we can use that. And AR, VR is already part of our car design process. So hologram just feels like the next sort of evolution of that for yeah. us. And those of you who have not seen uh, the hologram functionality, I think we had a quick video that we'll roll before we wrap up. So uh, I think there's a video. There's no replacement for in-person interaction, but we can feel like we're together, interacting with the same objects while being thousands of miles apart. Introducing WebEx Hologram, the industry's first real-time holographic collaboration solution. This is a holographic meeting. It's a shared, intuitive interaction, allowing remote participants to experience the same immersive event. It's a transformative technology for designers, engineers, technicians, innovators, and more. This isn't some far away vision for the future. It's available to a limited set of customers right now. The expectation of hybrid work has been elevated. Made up with some of our select customers. Uh, Thank you so much, Ed. I know we are out of time. There's so many questions that uh, I could have asked, but I appreciate you coming out. And for the audience here, if you're interested in some of the innovations we talked about, you'll hear more about it in the iTalk tomorrow and the keynote, and obviously the world of solutions where you can go experience those. So thank you so much, Ed. Appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Pleasure.